um, I sent you the updated PDF. Or I got it. Yep, yeah. we both got it. Yep, Okay. we got Great. it. Thank you. Yeah. And Nick, your email keeps bouncing to me. So, oh, that's uh, what I was telling you, because there was originally a wrong email that was entered and that keeps happening. Okay, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, we'll wait a few more minutes as people uh, people get in. Great. Well. We have uh, some nice cool weather here in Southern California. I don't know if anyone else online is from SoCal, but uh, the fog rolled in at the coast. So we've got a little bit cooler stuff. It'll burn off by mid morning. So um, I'm just sitting here uh, cool and happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, aren't you happy that this is going to be done and over with and you're enjoying the morning? That's right. Yeah. I, I knew. Yeah. So many positives. So many positives. I'll go out. I'll look at the flowers. You know, I'll, I'll do. <laughs> I'll do good things. Uh, yeah. you, you know, Janet gave a really nice talk. Janet Green. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah she was. So we, we have all of you in here. This actually worked out to be very nice, very nice. Oh, good. good. Uh, she did the charging stuff, I, I take it. Yeah, but it's, oh. it's a lot of science, you know, so yeah. the focus is to give sort of the science background for all of this. Yeah. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Well, we are at the end, so we don't have to do any more equations. They have been dealt with. <laughs> have you guys done all the equations? Oh, good. <laughs> I don't know if we've done all the equations. All right. <laughs> well, this will be a little bit easier today then. So, so we'll show you some interesting results. We'll talk about the overall um, context that all this is happening in. Um, so I'm not equation heavy on this one. So uh, because it's typically an area that a lot of people don't know a lot about. So first time through, it's always good to, to have a, a, an overview kind of perspective on this. <clears throat> Look, talking some about the physics, but the application um, and the societal applications for it, especially. So I, I'm gonna declare a quorum and uh, ask uh, and and ask uh, Kent to get started. Uh, the as as always, if you've got uh, questions, you know, put your hand up or or uh, put it in chat, and I will monitor that and interrupt Kep, Kent at an appropriate point. Uh, Kent, I'm going to let you introduce yourself because I see you have an extensive slide about your career. So. Um, we, we have been talking about careers, uh, alternative careers to, uh, you know, becoming a tenured stuff, stuffy old tenured professor at a, uh, at a, at a, a 12th century institution. Uh, so, um, okay. Yeah. So you can, uh, you can take it away. Great. So, uh, well, first of all, thank, thank you, Nick, uh, Lika, uh, Tammy, Kendra and the rest of the summer school participants, thanks for inviting me to come and participate here. <clears throat> um, uh, I'm from Space Environment Technologies. It's a company we've been around 20 years. Uh, we're the uh, premier uh, commercial space weather provider uh, globally. <clears throat> uh, the particular system that I'm gonna talk about here is the ARMIS system, stands for Automated Radiation Measurements for Aerospace Safety. Uh, and you'll see some uh, some detail about that. <clears throat> but it's really uh, an attempt to go over and characterize the uh, global 
aviation radiation environment. Um, <clears throat> a little bit about my background, uh, even though I've been at uh, SET, um, we organized that company back in 2001. We're approaching our 20th anniversary here. Uh, we're a small company, but we're located in five states across the United States. Um, and uh, my career uh, started out uh, at the end of the 1980s at NOAA Space Environment Lab in Boulder. From there, I was at uh, Berkeley as a researcher, a research scientist. Went to JPL, worked on the Galileo mission uh, for a decade uh, at Jupiter uh, with the uh, JPL team. Um, at USC, at the University of Southern California, I've been an adjunct faculty for 17 years teaching space environment class at Utah State University. I'm a director of their Space Weather Center. Um, and in addition to uh, space environment technologies, SET, uh, we formed a company back in um, maybe 2013, I guess, in conjunction with Utah State called QUP for um, HF communications uh, 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 specification and forecasting been on the uh, PI on a number of agency contracts and grants uh, for ISO, the International Standards Organization. I'm the US lead delegate to ISO for the space environments uh, standardization. Uh, like Janet maybe had mentioned a, a day or two ago, uh, both of us are on the American Commercial Space Weather uh, AXWA Executive Committee. Uh, it's been a, um, a very enjoyable experience uh, participating in that community. And my expertise er areas uh, range from uh, solar, ionospheric, atmospheric, and radiation physics, as well as their applications to solving societal challenges. So uh, having said all that. Um, hey, Kent. Yeah. Uh, so some people are working on small screens. Can you go into full screen mode? I sure can. can. Present presenter mode? Uh, is that any better? Uh, nope, not really. So if you, uh, can you, pre can you present, uh, rather than, uh, uh, yeah. So let me just see if I can get the, uh, whoopsie. Under the slide, under slideshow on the uh, about five. Yeah, there you go. Slideshow. Let me get rid of this. Presenter view. Yeah. How's that? Does that work? Oh, no, sorry, not presenter view. Okay, and show. So uh, you want like slide view or? or uh... Uh, yeah, so let's see if I can get out of this. Uh... If you just select play from start, that will take care of it. We're trying to, yeah. Oh, right On the here. Left -hand side. Yeah. Like that. There you go. Yeah. Oh, great. Thanks, I appreciate the, the help on that. Thank you, Brett. You're welcome. All right, so let's see. We'll go down to this slide. So uh, aside from um, an overview of, of who I am, let me try, kind of go over the background of, of, of what we're doing with this, this whole presentation. Um, the, uh, I, I want to cover just some of the background to the radiation environment. I'll go over some of the instrumentation that's involved in making the measurements. Uh, we spent a lot of time in the last uh, several years trying to get the calibration right of silicon-based instruments that Armus uses with uh, uh, things that are called the gold standard of measurements, the tissue equivalent proportional counter, TPEC, and I'll explain some of that uh, in this, this uh, discussion today. I'll go over some measurements and modeling efforts, uh, particularly the NIRAS model, uh, there's some interesting scientific questions that have come up. I'm going to raise those toward the end. And then finally, uh, overall, we're trying to achieve forecasting accuracy with this overall system. So I'll point out some of the efforts underway towards that and end up with pointing out how this entire activity is really an enterprise collaboration, uh, not just uh, industry or academia or uh, agency alone. So background, um, <clears throat> there's been an activity going on called Safe Sky. Uh, uh, despite the fact that I owe Kendra 
uh, and leak us some reports on this. Um, this community has, uh, has really grown. And there's, uh, I won't go through all these little icons here, but basically it's a, it's a Living with the Star Institute activity to really understand the mapping of the basic physics of what's going on down at the bottom right-hand slide with what's going on with the sun's magnetic field and configuration all the way up through how SEPs are generated uh, combined with the galactic cosmic rays. I don't know if you can see my pointer here or not. Um, but, uh, but that convolves with the solar wind, the, the Earth's magnetic field configuration and our radiation belts to then enable particles as well as uh, high energy photons to, to enter the, uh, the uh, Earth's atmosphere. Uh, <clears throat> there's a radiation environment that's, that's set up based on the interaction of those particles with our uh, uh, upper atmosphere, particularly the oxygen and nitrogen molecules. And when you combine that background radiation environment with uh, an aircraft configuration with its fuel, crew, passenger locations, materials and avionics, uh, any shielding that's occurring in that whole system, uh, and also you look at the regulatory environment, you now come up here at the very uh, top and you're able to understand basically what are the effect of <clears throat> uh, radiation uh, exposure on tissue as well as on avionics. So there's been a, a, a lot of uh, work done on that and I'll kind of go into the, some of the detail, but, but basically this is the entire domain that will lead to a radiation environment uh, up at the very top right here. Uh, and it starts down at the very bottom, which is the magnetic field configuration of the sun. So <clears throat> um, just a couple things to, uh, to point out to begin with is that the um, uh, galactic cosmic rays, and we all know that cosmic rays are really just uh, protons and uh, high, uh, higher energy particles that come from supernova and other phenomena in, high energy phenomena in the galaxy. Um, so that galactic, uh, uh, those galactic cosmic particles, as well as the solar particles from big solar flare uh, events, <clears throat> uh, that radiation will make its way to the Earth one way or another. Uh, and when it does, it interacts with the Earth's upper atmosphere. Uh, <clears throat> it is not a mono species or a mono energetic environment. So you can imagine that in, in the uh, natural environment, you have a very mixed radiation field. Um, you have the primary radiation coming in at the top, uh, but then as it hits all these atmospheric oxygen and nitrogen molecules, now you get a spray down uh, of secondary and tertiary particles. So you get electrons, you get all the neutrons of broken up molecules that are now spraying around. You get pions, muons, you get the entire electrical magnetic cascade. Uh, you get a lot of gamma rays, so all of which are photons. So all of this stuff really creates a mixed radiation environment. Um, and, uh, and so that environment we'll kind of talk about because different parts of it have different effects on us as, uh, as humans. Um, the third bullet, is just a highlight to remember from the very beginning, the intensity uh, of the primary and the secondary components of this radiation environment, they increase with altitude. So the higher up in altitude you go, the greater the radiation environment is, uh, and by latitude. So the higher magnetic latitude that you're at uh, also <clears throat> will enable a higher uh, dose to be measured, for example. Uh, the, the US FAA has estimated the air crew <clears throat> exposures are kind of anywhere from a two tenths to almost 10 millisieverts per year. If you want to compare that to an average nuclear power plant worker, um, it can be up to at least 10, maybe 20 times uh, the dose that a nuclear power plant worker gets. So for all respects, um, uh, uh, we know that uh, flight crew members are classified as radiation workers. But, you know, I look out across the, <clears throat> the um, 
Zoom right here. And I know, you know, half of you have your own Gulfstream 6s. So you're out there flying at uh, 50,000 feet. Um, more power to you. Uh, but you're also getting um, uh, four times the dose of this as well. So there's benefits and then there's uh, not so great benefits. Um, <clears throat> just a couple other uh, uh, takeaway points. Um, there's shielding by the atmosphere. So at sea level, it's about a thousand grams uh, per cubic uh, uh, per square centimeter at the sea level shielding. Uh, but once you get to 66,000 feet, which is where the, um, you know, the U-2 spy plane flies or uh, the supersonic uh, aircraft will fly in a few years this decade, uh, now at 20 kilometers, you're going to have only 55 grams per uh, square centimeter shielding. That means that you're getting about 400 times the dose that you are at sea level. And then finally, latitude, our geomagnetic field helps shield uh, particles. It, it, uh, through cut, it's phenomena called cutoff rigidity, which you probably uh, know about already. It allows the weaker particles to come in at the polar regions and, and it, it shields the, the lower latitudes, the equatorial regions from those particles. So only the really heavy particles, really energetic particles get in at the equatorial latitudes. Uh, that shielding discrimination then uh, means that you get a lot more particles coming in at the higher latitudes. And hence, with uh, <clears throat> uh, increase in magnetic latitude toward the poles, you do get a higher dose as well. Um, I will go through this in great detail. You'll have it as a reference. The magenta line, vertical line on the uh, right side shows where we are currently today. There's been four st stages that we're in discovery of the radiation environment, validation uh, using detectors and models. <clears throat> Monitoring has uh, been going for the last few years, uh, just with a few flights. And now uh, we're just approaching an era where we're starting to do some continuous monitoring. And then finally, in this next stage in the 2020s, uh, we're really looking towards now casting and forecasting. So you can see some of the detectors, some of the models that are being used on that. and. Uh, and that's really where we start today is that we're building on a legacy of, 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 of many decades of work here, but we also have a future that we're looking for as well. There's two instrumentation systems I'll talk about in particular. One is Armus. It's very easy to use in aircraft, uh, but we also fly it in Virgin Galactic Spaceship Two, uh, Blue Origin, uh, New Shepard, we fly that on. <coughs> uh, it's a silicon-based detector and measures all of the uh, ionizing radiation components. There's also the tissue equivalent proportional counter, TPEC. Uh, it's uh, basically the gold standard for human tissue against which all the uh, other detectors are compared. And I'll show you some of the calibration results there. So both of these detectors really are capable of detecting the primary and secondary radiation environments. The problem with TPEC is uh, it's very large and bulky. It's certainly not real time compared to Armus, which is a real time system. There are other systems out there. You can buy nice little gamma ray uh, uh, detectors for pro personal dosimeter systems. These typically just measure uh, X rays or gamma rays, maybe some beta particles um, in certain energy ranges, but they certainly don't capture the entire uh, uh, radiation field that, that we're subjected to uh, aboard an aircraft. So uh, they're of marginal use uh, if you're looking for regulatory compliance. <clears throat> um, there are some terms, exposure, uh, which is the amount of radiation traveling through the air. Um, main types of radiation monitors measure exposure. Um, there's absorbed dose, and that's the amount of uh, radiation that's absorbed by a person or an object. The SI unit for a dose is gray. Um, and in the US, uh, 100 uh, rads is, is uh, a rad is used in the US uh, often and uh, 100 rads equals one gray. Uh, there's also dose equivalent. So if we just take uh, 
uh, particles and, and insert them into tissue or material, uh, particularly in tissue. Now uh, there, we have to adjust what that effect of the radiation is in tissue. And that's called uh, dose equivalent. And we do that by figuring out a quality factor. It's just a scaling factor or a fudge factor. But it adjusts the uh, type of radiation based on the type of particle coming in. So one photon, one gamma ray, will do one ionizing event in your skin. But uh, a, a heavy iron particle uh, will, will um, do, as it comes in, will do many, many, many ionizations uh, th through the material, through your tissue. Uh, a new, so it has a kind of a weighting factor of 20. And uh, neutrons and protons have weighting factors of five. So the kind of radiation that you're in makes a difference. The quality factor is able to scale the raw dose and gives you kind of an equivalent dose, mainly for, for tissue. The unit for that in SI units is sievert. Uh, in US, US, they use REMS, 100 REMS equals one sievert. So these are just some uh, general limits. <clears throat> um, one of the interesting features is that, uh, that we now notice is that for pilots and air crew, uh, typically they've had deep tissue cancers for a long time. Uh, that's because the protons and neutrons, they're gonna enter the body. And, and think of it if you have prostate cancer. You go to a, a health center, a, a radiation center, and you'll get treated with proton therapy, let's say. So they take a proton beam, 200 MeV proton beam, and they tailor it and they make it go down a few centimeters down to your prostate, and then they'll, they'll burn the tumor right there in that location. Well, to get through that tissue, they need particles of certain energies. In this case, they use protons. Uh, so in the natural environment, the protons and neutrons are typically responsible for the deep tissue cancers like prostate, lymph lymphoma, that type of thing. However, um, it's also been determined that uh, crew members and probably frequent flyers as well have twice the incidence of shallow tissue cancers. Shallow tissue cancers are like basal cell carcinoma um, and uh, melanomas. So typically you think of getting those on your face or your scalp or your arms or so. But this pilot, these pilots and air crew members are getting them on the trunk of their body in, inside their clothing. Uh, the medical community is trying to figure out why. Usually it's ultraviolet A photons, which are lower energy uh, than we're talking about. But that's why you don't lay out in the sun is because you'll absorb a lot of those UVA photons. And they will... Uh, ionized down to about a millimeter uh, in your tissue. Uh, the studies have ruled out that uh, lifestyle is not a contributing factor. They're not all spending their time at uh, Cancun on the beach. Um, so <clears throat> they conclude that these uh, shallow tissue cancers are induced by ionizing radiation. And uh, in particular, um, uh, as we'll point out later on in the lecture here, that um, the Gamma rays from this natural radiation environment actually have enough energy to penetrate the hull of the aircraft and also down to the first millimeter of tissue in your skin. So as a result, we think that this, gamma, this natural radiation gamma ray source is now uh, a good candidate for uh, where this shallow tissue melanomas, basal cell carcinomas are coming from uh, in the trunk of crew member bodies. So uh, instrumentation, <clears throat> back in uh, uh, about two decades ago, some of the early instruments were flown on the ER-2. You see that in the right panel. It's really just a modified uh, U-2 spy plane, but this is the, the uh, uh, tail number 809 over at uh, NASA Armstrong Flight Research Center in Palmdale. Um, and uh, has these instrument pods, the, um, uh, the TPEC instrument flew on that back in the late 90s, and then we also flew the instrument uh, in 2015. And this is kind of the typical profile that you'll see. There will be a, uh, <clears throat> a takeoff. Uh, the dose goes up as you go up in altitude, and you fly along, and there's 
a little bit of variability there, and then it comes back down. So for the TPEC instrument, this is typically what, what we found. And this is for an elapsed time of, uh, say, six hours right there. So it goes up, takes off, flies along at some altitude, and comes back down. And there's uh, some other variability in there as well, secular or longer term as well as short term. Um, <clears throat> then, but we realized with the TPEC instrument, uh, which you can kind of see it sitting on the shelf right over here uh, in the, in the uh, instrument rack, uh, it's this big uh, thing that looks like a, um, a big cylinder. It weighs about <clears throat> um, 10 or 15 kilograms, so it's really quite, quite heavy. Uh, it's certainly not a real-time instrument. Uh, what we've done, we decided back in 2011 and 12, after the, NIRA, the NASA NIRAS uh, project was, was now well underway, we decided we needed measurement sets to feed to that model. So as a result, we set up the ARMIS program, uh, built the first instrument. This is it on the far left here. It's our Flight Module 1, FM1. It's the size of a big tray. In fact, we just decommissioned that instrument after uh, seven or eight years of flight or so, uh, sitting here on, uh, on our museum here at Space Environment Technologies, about uh, five feet away from me. Uh, but this big tray right here was our, our first instrument. It's sitting there in the NASA DC-8 uh, on an instrument rack. <clears throat> and it brought down the data uh, in real time through a Iridium FM link, uh, Iridium um, satellite link. Uh, over the next few years, we've gone through, we're now in our seventh generation. Uh, so you can see that they've gone from tabletop size instruments down to uh, handheld instruments. <clears throat> I'll talk about our FM7 in a moment, but uh, generally we've flown on all of these vehicles at this point. Uh, we have, um, and then most of these were permanent facilities on them. Uh, we are now just uh, preparing a CubeSat mission uh, that uh, will fly, knock on wood, hopefully uh, in the next few months. Hey, Kent. Yeah. So there's a question in chat about uh, planes that spend a significant time above the clouds and whether the backscattering from uh, the cloud layer could um, also cause some, uh, some um, uh, radiation dosage to the crew members. Uh, excellent question. Um, the short answer is uh, not significant. There's, there's not, there's not going to be a significant backscatter from, um, uh, for the radiation environment. Uh, for scattered photons, uh, that's, that's true, but those are mo mostly in the uh, visible and infrared wavelength regions, which are much, much yeah. lower energies. Uh, the gamma rays uh, would be the only scattering, real scattering phenomena. Um, aside from possible water molecules that the particles impact. But the clouds typically are in the range of, uh, you know, below 30,000 feet uh, for the most part. And, uh, and, and there are, there's already quite a significant amount of absorption of the radiation below that. Or, so in fact, we don't even really pick up a uh, signal of radiation environment until about 26,000 feet. So uh, I would say that um, uh, it's, a, it's a great question, but, but for the uh, backscattering or any albedo effects, uh, clouds do not play any significant role as far as we know. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, we're preparing a, uh, this is the, the center one here, the Blue Origin rocket. We're preparing for another flight there. Uh, coming up in a few months. Uh, next, uh, next year in 2021, we're doing a 30-day mission on the Worldview High Altitude Balloon. And then down here, you can see Spaceship Two, and we, we uh, just had our last flight, uh, most recent flight on Spaceship Two about a week ago. Um, uh, the Blue Origin, I'm sorry, the Worldview flight that we're going to fly, we're going to have multiple instruments on board. Our FM5 instrument will have a gamma ray detector. We're going to fly over the northern, uh, northwestern part of the continental U.S. Here's kind of a map of where we expect to fly. And here's the balloon taking off from Tucson, Arizona, 
uh, with the payload down at the very bottom right there. They're able to stay aloft for about 30 days. They use a ballast system to go up and down in altitude uh, that you can see there. Uh, <clears throat> what we fly on uh, commercial aircraft and on um, uh, some other aircraft are, and on the spaceship, the suborbital vehicles is this uh, FM7 unit. You can see it in its Pelican case right there. There's an app that's uh, paired, paired with it. So as soon as it turns on, uh, you get uh, the dough, you can control the instrument uh, through the app. And also um, we're doing a public version of that app uh, here in the next uh, uh, few weeks should be out on the uh, Apple store. So calibration, um, <clears throat> what we've done is we've done a, over, the num over the last few years since 2013, we spent a lot of time uh, building up to calibration. We're just now submitting a calibration paper, Space Weather Journal, and that should be uh, uh, into review and out uh, within the next uh, several months. So this is the Armas uh, FM7 unit right there. You can see it's a handheld device. It's got Bluetooth in it, the radiation uh, detector, detector, silicon device, has microprocessor, uh, has GPS in it. <clears throat> uh, there's the actual detector down at the, at the bottom left. The TPEC on the other hand is this big cylinder. So you can see it right there. Uh, and you have to analyze the data post-flight. So we go to these ground-based beam lines. On the far right, this is the Los Alamos Lance facility for neutron uh, beams. And you can see the, the beam line there. We line it up with a laser in order to uh, get the right location in the detector uh, where, that, uh, <clears throat> where that primary silicon uh, uh, chip is located. We do, we've done this in proton beams, uh, heavy ion beams, gamma ray uh, facilities. So four different ma major radiation fields. And along with that, um, while TPEC measures the quality factor, ARMIS does not. So we've had to come up with a method to determine quality factor to then scale the absorbed dose in silicon uh, uh, or the absorbed dose overall in tissue uh, to then get to a dose equivalent. And so this is uh, what we use on the right-hand panel. Uh, there's a, a set of work where they've looked at magnetic latitude and cutoff rigidities, how they affect quality factor. Uh, we're using the dotted line right there. That's what we use uh, in our operational software. On the right-hand side is just a, an example. Uh, we do, <clears throat> uh, by altitude, we we determine, we model as we process these data, we determine at a given vertical alt, uh, slice here, altitude is on the bottom, it's on X axis. And then the relative contribution of each species, whether it's protons, neutrons, heavy ions, uh, that's on the Y axis. And so if you take a vertical slice that adds up to one and based on where you are in altitude, we then partition the fractional a uh, number of particles or the contribution of particles so that then we can get the right quality factor. So we do that for every data point in a flight. Uh, <clears throat> we, after we compare the Armis and TPEC for the, the dose in silicon to dose in tissue for all these beam lines, we now uh, have a method to do the mixed uh, uh, atmospheric radiation environments now we do the validation and, and we've ha had seven validation flights where we uh, flown these, uh, this TPEC and the Armas together. This is an example of a flight on the top panel. We go up in altitude, we fly, and then we come back down. Uh, the colored dots are the measurements by Armas. The black line is the NIRAS <coughs> um, climatological, both, mostly the GCR component of the atmosphere, and the flight path down in the bottom left. And you can just see the, the comparison between them. But overall, uh, the bottom line here is that we do a, a very good comparison between uh, now our absorbed dose in tissue, in, in silicon, converting it to not only absorbed dose in tissue, but a dose equivalent. So uh, to date, we've had uh, 750 some flights. Uh, on, the on the left panel, you can see that globally, all these flights, we show them as every single minute 
is a black or is a colored dot. And uh, so you see the global distribution there. Uh, on the right panel, you can see uh, a pilot view that we're doing. Uh, this is a United uh, flight back in June of this year. They went from Denver to Los Angeles. And it shows the global context with our <coughs> uh, radian system, which uses NIRAS version two, which runs operationally on the SCT servers. We assimilate the, <coughs> the uh, ARMIS data into it. And then you get the, not only the actual flight path, but also the, uh, the, the regional uh, radiation environment as well. Uh, NIRAS uh, in version two, the left panel shows what the radiation environment was at the top of the Blue Origin flight that we did last December, uh, 90 kilometers near the top of it. And in version one uh, for commercial stuff, uh, we're showing examples uh, also on the right panels, both the satellite view as well as a um, latitude, longitude, uh, 2D view for the climatology. So let me just uh, kind of move on with some of the, <coughs> the uh, 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 what we're trying to do uh, with this. Uh, we realize that uh, we, we don't want just climatology, we want the weather of the radiation environment, much like they do with the ionosphere now, or with uh, tropospheric weather. They assimilate all kinds of measurements into physics-based models uh, to get a much better estimate of current conditions and forecasts. We're about 50 years later in the uh, radiation environment, but that's what we're doing. We're using the NIRAS version two as our physics-based model. And then we assimilate the ARMIS data into it. Currently, we have uh, only sparse measurements, but over this next year to two years, we're expecting to have uh, many more measurements operationally uh, in, in radio monitoring systems. So this kind of goes through how we take uh, flight data, we look at its magnetic latitude, components. And then at the bottom uh, right two panels, you can see the original NIRAS version two right here, a slightly enhanced one um, based on the data simulation, based on our information along these cutoff rigidities over North America. So uh, you've seen the flight on the left panel. Uh, one thing that we're doing for the pilot community now is we do these radiation curtains. So uh, in fact, the new Armis app will have this for the public version. Uh, you'll be able to see up to 90 kilometers what the radiation environment is based on the NOAA uh, G scales. We tie it to that. Uh, we have latitude from the South Pole up through the equator up to the North Pole. And then uh, altitude is here on the Y axis, uh, but we're just looking at one uh, longitude. So you can flip through different longitudes on this, but uh, this is just an example of how that curtain really drops down. The equatorial region is very open, uh, but then the, the higher magnetic latitudes have a lot more radiation environment. And that's because all these particles are coming in along those magnetic field lines. We drop this down to 20 kilometers, which is really where commercial uh, air traffic is flying below that region. And for that United flight over here, which we see in the left panel, you can see the flight path in the, in the lower right panel. You can see it took off from Denver, uh, went up to altitude, and then came back down to Los Angeles. Uh, these are the flight levels uh, listed here as well. And it just kind of clipped early, early in this first part of the flight over Southern Colorado, kind of clipped uh, the edge of this, this deeper radiation environment. But as you got more over Arizona, down to, towards California, uh, the dose in, um, decreased uh, this way as we went in latitude and then finally altitude effect there. So this is provided for uh, uh, all the flights. I'll just kind of finish up now with some science that we're looking at. Uh, these <clears throat> plots that we do for the ARMIS data show a lot of different features. There's four different things that I'll point out. The <clears throat> orange or brown arrow here shows how this black uh, baseline here is really the strong uh, uh, GCR background during solar minimum, for example. <clears throat> this is during a 2019 June flight. The red shows that 
you can get these big excursions for periods of time above the background of double the dose, and that's caused by precipitating particles at higher magnetic latitudes. This is up at L shells, you know, that are very high right here. <clears throat> um, in addition to that, the, the black arrow shows that as you change altitude, so uh, right here we went in altitude up a little bit higher, the dose rate went higher, and then finally the dose changes with magnetic latitude, that's the blue arrow. So as our magnetic latitude right here is starting to uh, decrease, you can see the decreasing uh, dose there. So those are some of the fundamental features that you see in these data. Uh, <clears throat> over our 750 flights, which is about a quarter of a million uh, minutes of observations at this point, uh, I show on the, <clears throat> the, the right panel top, you can see the, the red uh, NIRAS climatology during, this, during all these uh, geomagnetic uh, latitudes uh, for different um, uh, longitude locations. So these are kind of the red dots here, but above those dots, the measurements go uh, considerably higher uh, in these higher latitudes. So what is the source of this excess radiation? And it's not just in one case, but it happens across the board. This is for NOAA G0 conditions, so it's very quiet. And this is for 11 kilometer altitude, which is 37,000 feet. Um, so it's kind of these yellow bands that you see these higher uh, dose rates. The uh, hypothesis is, is that the radiation belts are leaky. And so we're trying to understand that better. Uh, we think what's happening is that um, <clears throat> the, as in one example, is you have these energetic relativistic electrons in the outer belts. This vertical line is for an October flight that we flew. These are the Van Allen probe data. You can see that kind of around L4, L5, L shells four and five, there's a depletion of the relativistic electrons uh, during, that, during that flight. And that was, there was also a period of strong EMIC waves that, that could allow for the uh, changing of the pitch angles of these electrons so that they would then get absorbed on their next bounce into the atmosphere instead of uh, bouncing to the other conjugate uh, hemisphere. Uh, so we looked at those energies of like one to 10 MeV, MeV uh, electrons. Uh, Guillaume Gronoff uh, has done the GAMP modeling here on the left. And he shows when you put those electrons in, you get the primary peak here, but then you get a big peak for the secondary gamma rays down here. And we're flying down in this mess down at the bottom right here. So we definitely, from a model point of view, we also get the gamma rays. Uh, Bruce Churitani and his community have also looked at this, uh, everything from 0.6 MeV all the way to 20 MeV electrons. And they get all this dose down here at aviation altitudes as well. So uh, what that tells us that from modeling perspective and our measurements, uh, we've combined this now in the left panel, we show our actual measurements uh, by Armas with the blue line here and the, at 11 kilometers and at 12 kilometers of uh, the GAT model was this, the bar, the, the black bar, the white and black bar that's uh, right behind it. So that tells us that that, that really is credible that, that what we're doing is we're seeing these gamma rays. Uh, <clears throat> as these, as the electrons uh, hit a, um, an oxygen or nitrogen at 60 kilometers, they break that apart. Uh, one of the, but as the electron stops, also they're, they have to give up some energy. So it's a Bremsstrahlung gamma ray photon that comes down. The atmosphere is transparent to all these gamma rays coming down, down to the lower atmosphere where we're flying. And those, those gamma rays come in, they hit the silicon. Uh, and that's kind of what we see with this Compton scattering effect down in, in here. So with that effect, the incident gamma ray is going to give off both a scattered photon, but also uh, uh, an electron as well. <clears throat> but uh, what this all points to then uh, is that, that uh, this, uh, this third source of radiation, it's, um, it's uh, uh, the, um, we know the GCRs are out there, the, the, the SEPs from the solar flares, and now we think these, these uh, <clears throat> precipitated 
uh, particles from the radiation belts are causing additional gamma rays. We think that these gamma rays are an additional exposure hazard for the crew and, and a reason for their shallow tissue cancers. Uh, we're looking for a community in the medical community to, to do that study with uh, in more detail. But, um, but in particular, uh, uh, it really seems to be that that L-shell band between two and seven appears to be the region of higher exposure for these cancers. Uh, if we know where those, uh, uh, where those beams are coming from, and we know what's happening with measurements, we can actually uh, manage that risk by flying, by flying a little bit lower in altitude or by flying a little bit more equatorward. It's just like uh, flying around a big thunderstorm is, is what, it, what it would be. So forecasting accuracy, uh, as I finish up here, we are uh, currently doing climatological forecasting. So you can see from the, the bottom left right here at eight kilometers up to the top right at 19 kilometers. The, these are the uh, NIRAS uh, climatological forecast for uh, G4 conditions. We have G0 through G4 right now. Um, <clears throat> we provide those out to the uh, community. Uh, we do a current EPIC uh, forecast and a 24 hour forecast uh, based on that. We also have the context of flights within the, the current uh, conditions right now. <clears throat> um, one of the interesting projects we're doing is under an LWS uh, uh, funded activity through the NASA Heliophysics Division. Uh, with uh, UCLA and University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, Jacob Bortnick is the PI on that. The system is called Orbis. And so they're doing, um, they, we are doing um, machine learned uh, neural net uh, representation of the uh, electro electron uh, <coughs> uh, population, electron fluxes in the outer radiation belts. So here you can see the L shells uh, right here, going from three to six. And uh, <clears throat> this goes six days in the past out to six days in the future. The vertical line is right now. Uh, this is from yesterday. Uh, but two things, two things drive that. Uh, one is the DST that we provide. So we do a prediction for uh, Air Force of the DST. There's a couple of different methods here. This is yesterday's DST. Somehow it likes to keep going back. And then we also use some solar wind parameters. And with Rice University, we're using their uh, Boyle index. So that now is enabling us to create, uh, based on the Van Allen probe rept data, we're able to create these higher energy electrons. Uh, and, and that project will be, uh, we'll be doing our public version of this website here in the next uh, period of time. I'll just conclude by saying that there's uh, group, groups in the overall enterprise arena that we work with. This is an example of uh, Arena uh, uh, Kiyotashvili's um, uh, project to in the heliophysics, or the, the, the helio portal uh, over at uh, NASA Ames uh, Research Center. Uh, they currently do a lot of flare and a lot of solar stuff, but they're going to start including the Armis uh, radiation database there. So that will be a very nice collaboration. And then in addition to that, um, uh, there's a lot of uh, activity that's led to this work. The NIRES itself has been the, the effort of agency, particularly NASA Langley, the CISM University activity and industry uh, collaboration. Uh, that all that NIRAS stuff is now being provided publicly. It's been provided publicly for a number of years, uh, and uh, it's now the NIRAS version two that's out publicly is operating on the the. Um, uh, Tell me to stop. Okay. Um, so that's on the SET servers. Uh, the Armas uh, data itself is an industry agency and university. Uh, collaborative effort. So there's a lot of agencies that have been involved in this, some universities, Prairie View a &M, University, Oklahoma State. Uh, we fabricated, tested, deployed these instruments. Um, we have an app that is out there, but we're doing the, the really the public version uh, later this month. It'll be on the 
Apple Store, and that will have a lot of situational awareness as well. <clears throat> uh, the Helio portal will enable access to this database later this year. And uh, next year, we uh, intend to do the demonstration of uh, tech, the technology demonstration of, of operational monitoring. And finally, uh, we have the model, the data, and now we're doing the data simulation. That's this Radian program, also a, a NASA funded activity under the Heliophysics Division. And there's many different groups that have been involved in this, uh, but we're leveraging other work to be able to improve the forecasting. The Orbis uh, radiation belt work is an example of that. Uh, we've done the calibration to the TPEC measurements to really get a much better accuracy uh, using silicon detectors, but to represent tissue kind of detectors. And finally, um, <clears throat> We're looking forward in the future towards developing ensemble modeling uh, in these next few years that will really help us un obtain a, an understanding of the overall uncertainty in these systems that we're, we're developing. So with that, I think, um, Nick, I, I guess that's my talk, but uh, I don't know, all the screens are, are black that I see there now. So I guess really people kind of fell asleep or checked out or something but uh there's there's uh, there's people there's people on oh okay <laughs> video on i think if you <laughs> scroll up or scroll down so all right turn your video on for kent uh so liz has a forecasting question liz uh you want to um so for, first before we do that let's thank ken for a, a very nice talk thank you I, then, I hear all the applause Okay, yes. <laughs> um, and then um, uh, Liz has a forecasting question. Uh, yeah, I didn't want to write it all out. So I'm just out of curiosity, what the, how are you planning, like in the future, what would you like this to be deployed as? As in like an airline would like input a proposed flight plan and then check the radiation levels and then like rearrange based on that? Okay, yeah, that's, that's an excellent question question is because we've been struggling with that for 10 years okay and we've gone through many different iterations of that uh, but I'll tell you where we we thought at first we'd fly a bunch of these armors things on aircraft uh, but the airline company said no nah, I, I don't think so you know it means we have to do all kinds of certification and you know we're not sure of the technology yet so, and plus we don't want the liability they, they didn't want to have to negotiate with their pilots and crew at this point. So at least in the US, that's what's happened. Uh, but they followed it. So uh, what we've done is we've built the FM7 device. It's a, it's a small handheld device. I got one, I got one in the other room. Um, but that device uh, is now, it, it's independent of the aircraft system. So uh, during the flight, if you have Wi-Fi on the plane, you know, not only can you measure it in real time, if you have one of these detectors, you can see it in your iPhone right here, but you can send it down to the ground if you want, you know, using the plane's Wi-Fi. So, or post-flight, you can download the data from the instrument and then send it off to the servers to be processed for the final effective dose rate products. Um, so we've developed that detector mainly for, um, uh, high-end users, so it's really the bi business jet community because these units cost about thirty thousand bucks a piece. Um, they're they're not cheap, and that's mainly because some of the parts are very expensive in them. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, we realize that not all the pilots and, and airlines are going to take these on, so we're doing this tech demo next year, and we're trying to look at the the strategy of doing flights of high altitude balloons, the worldview balloon is what we're using this time. It's gonna stay up there for 30 days and, and it'll, it'll float between about 65,000 and 75,000 feet. So it'll be up here at 75,000 feet, be measuring the dose and then they take, and they're taking advantage of winds going that direction. And then they pump air into the, the ballast area and the balloon sinks down to 65,000 feet and they take advantage of winds going the other way. And then they let the ballast out again. So now they can orbit a region taking advantage of winds in different, going different directions in different layers. 
So that system works well in, in seasonal uh, wind patterns, like in the summer northern hemisphere. Um, <clears throat> so we will be doing that next July as a tech demo um, for 30 days. And, and, we, uh, and the instruments that we have, the Armist FM5 that we have, has a reading in it. So it's constantly measuring dose every minute it sends back a data record, goes out via iridium, satellite link, then comes down to the ground. We get it on the ground, process it. So it takes about, uh, about two, within two minutes, really within one to two minutes after the measurement is made, we're already, it's already out on the web. So, so that's a real time system that's kind of at the technology readiness level seven now and with this tech demo, it'll be at, it'll be at an eight level. Uh, but that really is kind of a system we're looking at. Uh, we're also doing a CubeSat thing uh, here over this uh, later this year, and that will uh, start to demonstrate collection of the primary particles above the atmosphere in low Earth orbit. So we're doing a combination of different things. But uh, but yeah, it's it's a it's a tough problem. Um, we need to have more measurements, and we're trying to figure out strategies to do that. We've come up with a few things, but but we're not there entirely yet. In fact, uh, on that note, I wanted to bring up, so while I was at Ains, you know, have been thinking about this a lot. This is sort of the next step to, I think, space meteorology. We just need a lot of observations. Uh, finding smaller sensors, the kind of observations we need, and distributed measurements. I, I'll just briefly kind of touch on that in my next talk. And I, yeah, I've been working with Kent, what? Three solar cycles, Kent? Or four? <laughs> Probably four, yeah. Well, about four solar cycles. Yeah. Lika, Lika started out with me when she decided to find errors in my PhD dissertation. So well, He loves telling this story, I think. It's, Lika, yeah. Lika was the one who, who corrected my thesis after it was published. She said, oh, Kent. By the way, did you know this equation was wrong? <laughs> so we've been together a long time. <laughs> but yeah, but the point I was trying to make, the, the question is very important and we have to figure out strategies. Yeah. And I think I spent three years at Ames and I'm kind of uh, back at NASA headquarters armed with some of these um, information and kind of see how we can uh, begin to implement them. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah, Lika, oh, Lika in, in your next talk, if you might mention some of the, the effort to go to less expensive detectors and smaller systems and more mass distributed things. Yeah, that's, that's a great, great thing to look at too. Great. Other questions for Ken? All right. Why don't we um, uh, switch over to, let's take a 10 minute break. Um, and when we come back, uh, Lika will um, give us some of her thoughts. And then we will also um, hear about uh, some of your discussions that you had over the uh, over the, the day yesterday. So, uh, so ten minute break. Be back by uh, ten forty or forty after the hour, and um, and we'll we'll uh, hear from Lika.
Hi, Kent, are you still on? Yeah, I'm still here. Oh, thanks, thanks. I, I, I have, I'm, uh, have my screen blacked out. I'm still getting my act together for the morning, so. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I know ours. Paying attention. Yeah, yeah good, good to see you, yeah. Oh, good, sort of. <laughs> good to see you, black screen. <laughs> yeah. I have a question yeah, I, about uh, some of the work that uh, I think it's Joe Dyer has done uh, related to gamma ray production above uh, thunderstorms. And I was wondering if any of that kind of radiation is affecting flight um, activity. Uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, We've looked at that a bit. So, because, you know, we're trying to figure out, you know, with this excess radiation, what's the source right. of it? We looked at the terrestrial gamma ray flash issue. Uh -huh. um, uh, if you're flying, it, it may be an issue, uh, a small uh, part of the environment. If you're, if you're flying through these massive thunderstorms. Right. Which, which, which you shouldn't be doing. Which, which people don't do. Um, by the time that you get out, uh, you know, some tens of kilometers away or even further, uh -huh. now, and particularly in the, in the troposphere, because that's where all these flights are taking, taking place, um, now what's happening is the absorption of the gamma rays is going to be significant enough that, well, the... Uh, the density of the atmosphere at, at eight to nine kilometers pretty much absorbs all of the all of the gamma rays you know that are okay. of any significance and so if you turn the atmosphere sideways and say the distance between you and a um a, you know and a thundercloud is 50 kilometers or 100 kilometers uh the absorption is going to be significant enough that you really are not going to get those gamma rays um now the thing of it is is that so we looked at that side of it from the shielding perspective the other the other thing is that um these tgfs are microseconds you know in duration um so and and our system is integrating these these uh you know these ionizing events uh and and our shortest time scale of integration is 10 seconds in the instrument. I mean, we can, we can go down to the, you know, a hundred Hertz or something like that. We could go much quicker, but, but things are changing so slowly that we just integrate over 10 seconds. So you would have to have a lot of lightning, you know, to, to have, to make any significant uh, dose above whatever the background is doing, uh, even in that 10 second period, much less a, a minute that we end up actually reporting on in the in the dose files. So our conclusion was is that um, that you know people keep raising the TGF issue, but to be honest with you, um, I think it's I think it's a non-starter for that. Yeah. Okay. All right. I I heard one of his talks once, and he uh, you know just mentioned one thunderstorm that he had observed that he thought was pretty exciting yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, and and it wasn't clear to me if there were issues with secondaries or not um you know these things that that i guess they call runaway events but, yeah uh, i was just curious yeah i i mean i would say that there may be some really extreme examples you know where where that happens and you've get you got just a huge amount of lightning effects now if you're flying above these things, right above the clouds, these storms, the atmosphere, you know, the atmosphere is exponentially decreasing as you go up, of course. So the uh, optical depth would be much longer and you may get the combined effect of stuff uh, if, you're, if you spend a lot of time flying right above the storms. But, um, and maybe, you know, maybe the hurricane hunters, <clears throat> uh, when they fly above the hurricanes, actually get some of that but oh. uh so that that's something i've i wondered about uh mm -hmm. because we're going to get a lot of lightning in in around the eye off the eye walls of the mm -hmm. hurricane mm -hmm. <clears throat> but um 
Yeah, so. So guess who else is thinking about that? <laughs> so we, are, oh man, we have an FDL um, topic going on this year. And so the for me, the goal was twofold. You know, this is kind of in partnership with IBM, um, Lockheed and NOAA, but uh, the GLM monitor, have you seen the data from the GLM monitor, the global lightning mapper? It is just incredible. So it is actually one of the uh, uh, tools for uh, weather uh, data. So mm -hmm. this year we are actually prepping all the data to really address kind of uh, you know, whether the lightning affects sort of convection cells of hurricane. So very focused on weather. My second year goal is when this data is ready, we can begin to start using it for all other activities in space weather, where we might find linkages, we might not. Yeah, I... Who's uh, uh, the lead on that? Uh, for the uh, lightning uh, mapper topic, uh -huh. it's uh, Tim, whose last name I'm forgetting, from Lockheed. Okay. Uh, I'll send you a separate message about yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is, the, the, there are just, uh, yeah, that's why I kind of came away very excited at the different kinds of possibilities that exist, you know, at these interfaces where we ask these questions, but unless we bring a lot of data, we really can't address this. And sometimes they do exist, but in another discipline. Yeah. Uh, Kent, back to your comment. Um, what about uh, the growth industry in um, stratospheric flying aircraft? I mean, potentially you could end up, if you know that new generation of aircraft come, come along, uh, you know, flying above thunderstorms. I, just struck me that that's a possibility. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, um, like, you know, Arian, uh, you know, the, the um, well, certainly the, the Virgin Galactic suborbital stuff, uh, mm -hmm. their, long, their long distance uh, plans. <clears throat> uh, there's, a, there's a lot of different regimes that people are thinking of flying in. And particularly for the supersonic aircraft in, in the uh, mm -hmm. lower stratosphere, Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that there's a um, uh, the, my sense is they haven't fully addressed the the radiation issue uh, there. Yeah. But now they have they have an advantage because they're going a lot faster, so they're spending less time in the environment. So it's the it's the whole Lara thing, you know, as low as reasonably achievable. Mm -hmm. So you know you can reduce dose by spending less time, or being in a lower radiation environment, you know, so there's a couple ways to, to manage the problem. So they do spend less time in it, but clearly they are going to get a, a much higher dose. They're right below the thoughts or maximum uh, okay. when they're flying. So it's a pretty strong environment they're getting. So, yeah. I think Leek is, thank, thank you, Kent. I think it looks like Leek is getting ready to go. So yeah. I'll be quiet now. Uh, oh, I said, please go ahead and chat. I'll wait for uh, Nick to say, oh. go. Okay. Well, uh, this has been a, a stimulating conversation. I'd like to uh, continue further. And Kent, I'll be in contact with you a little later on this afternoon uh, regarding some other matters we're collaborating on. Sure. Okay. That, that sounds great, Dolores. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Dolores, can I can I make a pitch for what you guys are doing with the glossary? Oh, absolutely! I've been meaning to put something up for the for the students. I've I've got my virtual bookshelf up, but I haven't really said anything to to this group at all about the glossary. Do you have anything up? Uh, yeah, I've, we have a, a prototype up. Um, wow! <laughs> uh, it's so just so everyone knows, uh, Dolores and uh, uh, her student uh, undergraduate. Uh, Kaya, is that how you? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, Kaya, uh, have done a space weather glossary. Uh, we're going to incorporate some of that stuff into the ISO standard on space weather definitions. 
So that will be uh, available for the community to, to critique and, and do, but uh, that's been an ongoing activity. But Dolores um, and Kaya's work, uh, Kaya has produced a space weather glossary. Uh, if you go to, um, let's see, the, uh, if you go to sp uh, spacewx.net, And then at the very bottom footer, there's a, a link to service. And the, the bottom link of service says Space Weather Glossary. And so this is just a directed page over to what uh, Kaya has produced uh, so far at University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, but she goes through the entire um, uh, A to Z uh, definitions, uh, terms, the domain that it's relevant to, and then even ancillary information as well. Images, you know, for like active regions on the sun or atmospheric drag or so forth. So it's, it's a, really a nascent uh, activity. Um, I'll put something out for uh, uh, Nick to, to share and, uh, yeah. Yeah. and he can grab the information for you too and we can maybe continue this on just a little bit later but we are just getting underway so if your favorite term isn't there you can email me and we'll get your favorite term in thank you dolores uh this is amitava i actually agree with this this is very useful information and but maybe you and ken can take this offline from here onwards because the students are all back and uh, I'll be serving as moderator for uh, Madhulika's lecture and just as usual, as all moderators do, I'll be monitoring the chat and hands up uh, for all the students. So with that, Madhulika, would you like to um, share your screen and start your lecture? I think I am sharing my screen, correct? Yes, you are, but- uh, I will make it present uh, slide mo show mode. Please, yes, now it's working. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, I myself need to see the screen and there are just so many other things everywhere. You know, it's, it's, I'm not very sophisticated at this yet. But after a year, I think we will all be, you know, just like uh, really great at Zoom presentation. Um, Thank you all for kind of allowing me to speak, speak at the end, which probably is actually an appropriate place to end. Um, believe it or not, you students, I learned as much with all of you from all these um, various uh, topics because we as individuals can only absorb so much. We all have our areas of specialty, but of course, over time, I have a broad general idea. So what I wanted to do here, instead of give you a, a big overall NASA perspective on space weather, where there is so much going on right now from uh, human exploration to in the heliophysics division to you know, right share aspects to going back to the moon. I, I just thought I'll, I'll keep it kind of focused on the kind of things we have been discussing. You know, you've already learned the underlying um, principles, I would say more or less of heliophysics, uh, which is so space weather is kind of, you know, a manifestation and impact of these sciences that and interactions that happen. And, and take you to one of the areas of uh, space weather components produced by the um, sun um, that has tremendous impact here. So I start off by saying, you know, human access to space is expanding and in a new realm of deep space exploration, we all know that we are excited about that. Space tourism and the society's uh, increasing reliance on rapid and reliable aviation. You just heard from uh, Kent. So particle radiation pos possess really significant uh, hazards for astronauts, uh, satellites, aviators, and passengers, and of course, affects planetary bodies. Um, 
And to that, you have to now fold in the increasing galactic cosmic ray fluxes near successive solar minimum that we have been uh, observing. And this kind of highlights the increasing um, situation and awareness for radiation hazard. So let me take you through kind of some of the uh, bit of work. And this is work meaning br bringing cohesion to the things we are all doing. Uh, in the way of a workshop that I held at uh, NASA Ames when I, be, I was doing details for three years. And this was really a workshop to bring together everyone to kind of, um, kind of the stated purpose was really exploring ways to enable data rich characterization of the environment, whether it is the aviation altitude environment or whether it is the deep space environment uh, with uh, you know, monitoring space environment in these areas, because we don't have uh, a lot of data. And as you know, with any models we use, if we are data starved, then our models really can't progress. And you were hearing Ken talking about, you know, kind of assimilative more, uh, uh, models, right? For which you need data. And then we'll have model competitions to see how well they perform. So the goal was to create a multidisciplinary, um, you know, multi-directorate, multi-center, uh, academic, all of that environment to kind of start a dialogue on how do we kind of begin to characterize radiation, you know, beyond if in aviation altitude and beyond low Earth orbit. So I'm going to show you something just um, uh, to kind of, um, you know, complete net sick. This is almost like um, storytelling. You have already seen this, you know, drivers of space weather. This is yet another way of kind of showing it, bam, in front of you. And of course, you can blame it on the sun. It is that magnetic field on the sun that is creating all of this manifestation. So three different components, you know, very nicely tied to the three different aspects aspects of the NOAA scales, electromagnetic radiation, and it's, you know, everything in the electromagnetic spectrum, basically, ultraviolet, x-ray, gamma rays, sometimes takes eight minutes, simply because it depends on the distance between sun and earth, that is the R scale. Then you have uh, essentially uh, matter, charged particles, which have mass, kind of taking it's time to move a little slowly behind 10 to 30 minutes. And as you can see, there isn't in these questions were asked of Bill Marta, you know, I mean, what do you do about this? You really can't uh, forecast this unless you know what the sun is going to do. And then so these, um, all of these are affecting, you know, radiation, astronaut health, aviation, satellite function that Janet uh, talked about. And then finally, you know, what really kind of something that we learned in the last several decades of the 20th century is uh, the, the, the power of coronal mass ejections, matter and magnetic fields. You know, these are magnetized blobs that can take between 18 to 96 hours, four days, depending on how this energy is unleashed and what are the conditions in the interplanetary medium, uh, etc. And these kind of cause really havoc with our geospace uh, environment. Everything else does too, but this has mass and momentum and magnetic field. And it just perturbs very many different layers of our system, you know, kind of messing up with radio communications, navigation, power grids, pipelines, anything with on, on, on and off electromagnetic switch has the potential basically to be affected. And you already know all this. I also kind of want to go and talk a little bit about the usage of words, you know, space weather versus radiation. I mean, there is basically a confusion sometimes between terms space weather and radiation in a study of operational requirements. So I kind of wanted to define, at least for this talk, what do we mean? Space weather is the broader term and it kind of encompasses a wide range of phenomenology with operational impact. And 
the dominant subset of space weather impact is related to the radiation or energetic particle environment, including electrons, protons, neutrons, and charged ions with energies from KeV to GeV. And you have seen these in multiple talks and most recently from, um, you know, Ken. And so the radiation environment inside the spacecraft or habitat is modified by the surroundings, basically. And, and you can think of our atmosphere as one of those two. It's a habitat, and it actually modulates what comes on the surface of it. And so this we are talking about in this case, shielding, atmosphere, tissue, et cetera. And can, these can be enhanced by human-induced radiation sources, as well as you know, natural radiation sources. So human-induced radiation sources are, for example, power supplies, medical monitoring, or um, radio isotopic tracer. Sometimes we use them on our spacecraft to keep our instruments heated. So scope of space, space, space weather, again, I'm kind of going through the process of kind of laying it out, NASA's interest in this. And that is, you can see, there are like four items that I have highlighted. Uh, it's human spaceflight, absolutely. Uh, robotic missions, launch support, and aeronautics. What people kind of often forget, the first A in NASA is actually aeronautics. So I don't want to go over this because you have already heard so much about this, but in human spaceflight, you know, it's the radiation exposure uh, increases risk to long-term astronaut health. Uh, sometimes uh, it could be just a risk of acute effects. And what we are figuring out with more and more testing that is just not cancer, it can be cognitive, and that just poses even greater threat when we go on our long uh, distance excursion to uh, Mars. And radiation can even damage, right, uh, critical electronics, and that's problematic when you are kind of uh, outside the low Earth orbit. And then there are robotic missions for launch support. This, there are single even upset risk to avionics. So everyone's got to get a space weather all clear kind of signal to move forward. And then for aeronautics, again, I'd say, um, Ken kind of tried to describe, you know, what, what's that word? Communication interference or loss? Absolutely, you know, when there's disturbance in ionosphere, risk to av avionics, that's become even more important now because we are moving away from mechanical component on airplane, but going into more what we call, um, you know, uh, electronic integrated module and one fails, a lot of components uh, fail. And then enhanced uh, exposure to radiation uh, crew. These, these are kind of still, we are in the process of accepting and absorbing all this knowledge. Uh, uh, Federal Aviation Administration still does not have any guidance for us regarding uh, radiation for aviation crew in the US. So principles of uh, radiation protection, you have seen this. Radiation of biological concern to the human space flight program is primarily ionizing radiation. And that's why you hear dosage and people measuring those components. And ionizing radiation is produced by energetic particles. You've already kind of learned quite a bit about that. And the sources are galactic cosmic rays, solar particle events, trapped energetic particles. You have heard a lot from different presenters here. So there is radiation in past and current space flight operations. Like there's the Apollo era from where we learned the history of what could have happened that didn't happen. And then there is shuttle, which is also now gone, but we have the International Space Station. We are still uh, sending astronauts and bringing them back. And then there is, of course, radiation and future space flight missions. We have moon and Mars beyond, and we are actively preparing to go to the moon with the Artemis um, concept. And then the, 
larger picture for people like us who are interested also in the science is characterizing the radiation environment, you know, observations and then forecasting and kind of breaking it down into components. There is deep space radiation and there is radiation that is uh, closer to home in the avionics um, uh, world. So effects of ionizing radiation, you know, charged particles lose energy by ionizing the matter they pass through. And this rate of de deposition, as it's called, it's a DEDX, it's linear energy transfer, LET. But this is, LET is also proportional to the power of the atomic number. That's why high Z atomic numbers, which really come from galactic cosmic rays, are absolutely lethal. And this also includes nuclear, nuclear interactions, fragmentation, secondary showers, and the damage overall to any of these structures is proportional to um, LET. And, and then there is, of course, protecting electronics. And this is, this is a pet sort of topic of mine of the unknown, unknown variety. Of course, there's memory corruption, CPU errors, part failure, but a lot of the things that we are building today, this super uh, microprocessor, they haven't been tested in space and they need to be, even though we put in a lot of uh, redundancies. And then protecting uh, humans, basically which we have talked about already before. Very simply, you've probably seen this in some of the presentations given, you know, what are the sources of ionizing radiation? And this is just focused on the sun, solar particle event. I'm not going to give you the details of the production of galactic cosmic rays, but we know they penetrate into Earth's um, solar system's heliosphere and then get modulated by the uh, electromag uh, the solar uh, magnetic field of the sun. But th this just kind of gives you, you know, pictorial sense, you know, uh, where energetic particles are accelerated. We can't see them, right? So we kind of have to visualize them. Where do they originate from? It can be flares, it could be shock acceleration through CMEs, lots of different processes. And, and we still don't understand it very well, how to predict it. And so we are looking at all kinds of data to do forecasting and, um, on, um, you know, uh, predicting and utilizing even deep learning tools to see if it can shed light. Um, characterize, uh, why characterize uh, radiation sources? Well, uh, you know, basically to um, understand the risks to astronauts and spacecraft um, those are the two. And I've given two examples here. Any of you biologists here, you can see how, how our uh, DNA structure chromosome can be altered by this kind of intense uh, radiation. Just, just kind of provoking your thought, giving you reason why we are doing this. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this is the next one. And um, so this actually gives you some um, definitions, uh, you know, multitude and scope of effects. So at the International Space Station, one REM, it's, it's Rongent equivalent man. One R R REM kind of dosage is what we get during one CAT scan. Uh, space suits on moon can receive up to 50 REM that can cause radiation sickness. 300 uh, REM plus, if one receives that, can cause to uh, fatality for 50% of the subjects within uh, 60 days. And you know, over time we have lost to communication satellite, airplanes get diverted uh, from polar regions often, satellite tracking problems, degradation, all of these things kind of happen. And what is interesting is talking about, and this is the uh, S scale for NOAA that is broken up for you from S1 to S5, so that you can see how often they occur during a solar cycle and what are the biological impact. So the question is how big is big? 
how potentially fatal it can be. And so between, you heard from Dolores, like the wonderful work she did uh, during the Apollo era. So between Apollo 16 and Apollo 17, there was a flare on August 7. And if that astronauts were exposed to that, because we didn't have really appropriate shielding mechanism, that would have been near fatal. The derived dosage during that particular uh, flare was about of the order of 400 REM. And so, you know, Michener's space book is based on that event. This is um, really kind of giving you very quickly um, the whole concept of space radiation environment from the sun into interplanetary medium, into our Earth's environment, or whatever in environment we choose to uh, talk about, whether Mars, whether Moon, whether uh, Jupiter, it could be anywhere. And so we know the process. The picture is drawn for us. So solar particle events associated with really CMEs medium to high energy protons, largest doses occur during maximum solar activity, not currently predictable. And the goal, main problem is that we have to develop realistic forecasting and warning strategies, and we're still at it. We're still doing new observations and we're still making our model better. We are going into assimilation and using newer tools and techniques like deep learning. Then we go to the trapped radiation, and these are medium energy protons and electrons, effectively mitigated by shielding, which is the good thing. We have kind of a solution, mainly relevant to International Space Station. And again, the idea is that we have to develop accurate dynamic model in time. And then we go to galactic cosmic rays, and these are high energy protons, highly charged energetic atomic nuclei in and so we so the, this this is what we are dealing with these are 10 mev primarily protons but lots of heavy ions electrons neutrons they they are always there it's it's really the sun's magnetic field that modulates it when we are in solar minimum the magnetic field is weak we just get a lot of penetration of galactic cosmic rays so there is never any good time to go out in space for fun and excursion without recognizing what those risks are. Not going to talk about this because um, Kent already kind of gave you a lot of information on that. This is the uh, health effect. And I think uh, Kent talked about that also. I'm just going to point out, I don't know whether he mentioned this, I can't remember, but it typically we've calculated with the current models that we have, you know, like a round trip international uh, flight is of the order of two checks X-rays. If you are if you are a hundred k uh, mile fly, uh, flyer, then um, you get twenty chest X-rays from what you have done. That's about two millisieverts. These are significant amount that people are beginning to think about. Then comes the aviation uh, uh, radiation and its impact on avionics. And this, this is really, this is where I think we have to think collectively, even among the science uh, community, uh, carefully, as I was mentioning, you know, there have been near catastrophic event and Qantas flight 72, October 7, 2008, you know. And, and as we are learning more, it seems like these were secondary showers that took up some uh, components. But th these are the things we are after along with, of course, uh, the things we fly in space. But the, you know, uh, there is also galactic cosmic rays penetrates, um, you know, we get uh, neutron monitors and we can also begin to see its impact on single level event upsets on basically our computers you know, uh, bit flips. I'm still trying to get the, collect the data to kind of see if we can create a global model of uh, our magnetic field topology and how, how and from where these are coming. Because we start off, of course, everything being spherically symmetric, right? And that's, that's where we are. Very quickly, 
this is the solar uh, cycle that uh, um, I have plotted, which is the last solar minimum. And we really haven't come out of it. Uh, this solar minimum is, you know, we can never say how deep it is till we have come out of it, but it is as deep and maybe deeper than the last. But what we are beginning to see is the galactic cosmic ray population is already at its highest ever. So that kind of gives us a clue about what the solar magnetic field is doing. This is really a concept, cartoon concept of space weather support uh, to NASA missions, basically. And uh, kind of these are all the things we have to measure. We have to monitor the sun 24 seven with different kinds of instrument, you know, measuring the magnetic field around on the far side over the poles, measuring the energetic particles, looking at the active region growth, looking at CMEs. Then we have to look at the interplanetary medium. We just can't stop looking at the sun and then say, oh, we'll measure everything at L1 and you know, voila, we have some model, no. So this is a continuous process. This is a big picture outlook. But if human beings are really going to take that next step of exploring the next frontier, which is beyond low Earth orbit, then these are absolutely vital. And you know, someday we will get there. Right now it's still ideas. And, and I kind of, probably, I have a few more charts, but I just want to end basically with this chart. And I kind of like to show this for awareness, you know, kind of uh, don't be sad and pessimistic thinking, oh, we have so much further to go. But look at where terrestrial weather used to be. You know, so there, there's this whole process of, awareness, recognition, reporting, short-term useful forecast, long-term greater sophistication. And you can go from 17th century, you know, barometer, thermometer, hygrometer, anemometer. Then 1750s, synoptic studies of solar system. 1850s, compiled area-wide observations, 1920s, polar front theory of extra tropical cyclones. And today I was just talking about GLM, the lightning mapper. That's like a flash taking all the lightning and trying to figure out, you know, how they impact any convection cell in a hurricane. 1940s, World War II led to a lot of growth. And then in the 50s came the computer age and then the 60s, the space age. And if I continue to draw this outward, I'd say the next stage is really the utilization and synthesis of all the data with the new sophisticated fancy statistics that we call artificial intelligence or deep learning, because we haven't assimilated all our data yet. And so now look at space weather, you know, 15th century awareness. So, you know, in a way we were there ahead you know, sunspot observations, we have a lot of historical data. Then there is the same phase of recognition, reporting, and usefulness. So we are at the short-term usefulness forecast place, I think. So 18th and 19th centuries, we started, you know, uh, developing magnetometers. That's what give us, you know, KPAP index. Uh, 1840s, it was, you know, telegraph was the Victorian age equivalent of today's internet, that was the thing that could be impacted. And that was pretty significant uh, during the 1859 Carrington event, which kind of made the first connection between sun and earth. But we didn't know the details. And today we know so much more. And so 1920th centuries, you know, networked uh, magnetometers, aurora, sunspots, flares. We, we, we are continuing on into that in 21st century. I should add 21st century, NASA's Living with a Star program, which did contribute a heck of a lot of science and continuing to do so uh, through launching, you know, Parker Solar Probe, Solar Orbiter, Solar Dynamics Observatory, Van Allen Probes, and focusing our research with, uh, which is both curiosity-driven and user 
inspired. And World War II played a much bigger part also for a space weather component. And it's the same thing. It's the computer age, it's the 60s, and we are beginning to use the tools of um, artificial intelligence and also building towards longer term forecasting, uh, climate uh, prediction. And this is, I'm talking of space climate and space weather. And with that, I want to say thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Madhulika. There is a lot of time for questions. And I think uh, this is a really good overview for students to carry away with. Would like to open the stage for people asking questions. Dana is giving a thumbs up. So we should communicate that. Uh, but comments, questions from students? One thing that if I may volunteer Madhulika for it, I haven't sought her permission, so I might get scolded for it, is that as you know, she has played a fairly unique role in NASA Science Mission Directorate in the articulation of various programs, missions, and uh, the Living with a Star program has benefited greatly from that. And some of us had the privilege of serving and steering committees and so on and so forth. Um, and a lot of this is lifeblood for the community, as you know, both in terms of science and very importantly, how science gets funded. So she has unique perspectives on that in addition to the science that she does. Uh, so if you have questions, broader questions than the immediate subject of the talk, this is a good time for you to ask her. You know what I will do while they are thinking, because I, I thought I was, you know, I generally tend to run uh, late and I wasn't sure, but very quickly, let me tell you what are the next, why did I do the workshop, right? I had a goal to collect mm -hmm. information and just, just going to run through this, you know, basically what, what I was trying to do. Can I ask is, you a question. How many slides do you have here on? Oh, this? just three or four, very That's quickly perfect. like this. But yeah. we'll still leave time for questions from them. That's great. Yeah, and anyone can stop and ask me question because there was a lull in question. There yeah, was please. some more information that I can at least share. They are all there in the charts. And, and so the goal was, you know, kind of developing uh, a, a scenario and a domain within this aviation and deep space uh, level, right? Uh, like, um, what are the current scenario? You know, we have issues uh, that- you want to make your slide full screen, Madhulika? Oh, yes, yes, Would yes. You please, thank you. Yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is uh, basically in aviation altitude, the domain is aviation altitude. The scenarios are passenger crew exposure in response to a solar event or characterize the cutoff rigidity for multiple magnetic latitudes and longitudes. And th these are things actually I have worked with uh, Kent quite a bit. He even had an experiment, for example, during the total solar eclipse of 2018, which he can tell you about a little bit. And then the, for deep space, the domain was the cislunar space because that's where we are going. So plus minus 0.1 AU from Earth and, and where we want to characterize, you know, SPE over tens of degrees of helio longitude latitude at one or more distances from the sun. So that cartoon I gave you kind of is based on these kind of needs essentially. And then the deep space habitat, uh, which is kind of in deep space, you know, it, it's the gateway habitat, right? It's the lunar surface architecture elements for human exploration. So these were kind of the concept and we, we broke out into um, you know, sort of separate groups to create scenarios essentially. And, and this is what, you know, there were uh, examples of those concepts where then 
uh, fleshed out in greater details into uh, scenarios, which was uh, really fun. So for deep space, you can see the concept that came away was hundreds of microchips dispersed over vast areas, each sensitive to one or more threshold proton energies, you know, relatively few small sat communication nodes to relay data to Earth. So people were thinking out of the box. That's what we have to do. And now we have to figure out, you know, how do you take these concepts and not make it overwhelming because now we have tools and techniques, right? We have uh, cube sets and small sets and how can we utilize all of that and work with our industry partner and write share to kind of- well, Monica, There is a question here that is very apropos to what you are saying from two of the students. Please stop me anytime and ask me. Sure. So these are in the chat. Uh, one is from Liz. Uh, do we need separate observatories for each body we travel to like we do at Earth L1? Will we need space for the observatories around the moon? If SWPC provides the forecast for Earth systems, who is going to do so for farther out in the solar system? To which Gwen also adds, have we considered a fleet of CubeSats as you just mentioned, or even smaller satellites as a space weather observatory? I have a very short, simple, answer and then i'll elaborate you will your generation will we have kind of figured out some ideas and i'm still kind of pushing these at the concept level right but bureaucracy takes a long time to implement so it's your generation will have to grab hold of these you are the future explorers so you will do it and we are giving you some of the know-how that we know today. That's kind of how I would answer it. And the answer is yes, we have to. Think of, think of the terrestrial weather um, platform as kind of that demonstration to make this planet our home, which came naturally to us, but to grow it you know, we had to learn a lot of things. And we have done that. And we are getting good at weather forecasting, not because we have kind of figured out all the physics of meteorology, but we are also bringing observations. They go hand in hand. It is the power of assimilation. And, and so we, ha we have to do all of that as we go from one body to the next. Uh, would it be fair to say that CubeSats are actually uh, already in a way in the program? Uh, do you see uh, uh, opportunities here where people could actually within the existing structure propose such things? For, Absolutely, uh, it exists. In fact, uh, th th there's a lot of growth uh, in the heliophysics division in the technology part of it. It stood up a new technology definition team. Uh, we have low cost access to space that used to be largely suborbital. Now it's suborbital, balloon, right shares, because there are other you know, commercial space sector that are flying more frequently. So yes, uh, there, there are a lot of opportunities and there'll be a lot more opportunities in future. We also have um, Science and Technology Mission Directorate, it's STMD. So I'm in Science Mission Directorate, it's all science. The STMD actually is looking at new innovative technologies, right? So for communication, for propulsion, because these are challenges. These are things we have to overcome. If I want to go sort of inward of uh, Lagrange point one and hover to get early uh, information of what's coming from the sun, right? By the time it comes to L1 and I know that the magnetic field is southward, we have very little time. What I, if I could push my observatory inside, you know, closer to the sun, 
doing all of those kind of missions require different kinds of propulsion technology. Solar sail, for example, we could, if we had solar sail, we could be hovering in these places. We could be hovering over the poles of our uh, own planet to kind of look at the auroral geometry. It's not just beautiful, but it has important physics in it. So yes, we, we are already doing it. We have to develop, I think, sort of global approaches, integrating them. Any other question? Uh, yeah, I, I have a, a question. Um, kind of going off of what Gwen put in the chat on, you know, considering CubeSats for this kind of activity. Um, I, I know that there are some CubeSats that are already set to do certain kinds of missions related to space weather, but I also know that one of the challenges in using CubeSats for this kind of a thing is the shorter life, lifetime of the mission. Um, whereas if you want a constant uh, monitor, monitoring of space weather, you, you obviously need something to stay up longer. But I'm just curious if from your view of things or your insight, if you've seen anything perhaps technologically speaking, that is uh, addressing that specific issue, whether it be um, iterative CubeSat missions or the actual uh, CubeSat itself having some sort of technology meant to extend that lifetime. I, I think um, it is a strategy issue right now. So we have to fly these smaller things to see what we can get out of them. It's only in their failure that we know what are the next things we have to do to make them robust. Um, I'll give you some examples. I mean, just because we want to forecast doesn't mean that uh, we have to fly kind of what NOAA does, you know, the ghost satellites. They have to be very, very reliable. Sure, well, sure. NOAA depends a lot in tech transfer, pretty much everything NOAA flies today has gone through the domain of science. So for example, SUVI instrument on NOAA is really an extension of AIA. Every single such instrument has a heritage in science. Once something becomes reliable, you can pass it on to the uh, you know, operational agency. That's kind of how we work hand in glove. We do the science, we develop the concepts of instruments, we show what works, what doesn't, and then we can pass it on. And we continue to kind of go to the next frontier of either you know, instruments for observation building, new or to answer science questions that are important. That, does that kind of address your question? Uh, I, th I think so, yeah, thank you. Any other questions? I think I might have just one other slide. Let me just go there. So these are, okay, very quickly, these are our biggest challenges put, you know, this is what we came to learn after the three day workshop. Lack of data is the biggest one in case of aviation. It's not only lack of data, we need four dimensional data as a function of three spatial uh, dimension and, and uh, time. So very, very important. And one of the spatial dimension is height, right? And that becomes also very uh, important. And uh, some of the examples people were giving for near term solution was airlines to carry sensors as uh, Kent's been talking about. And I'm still working some concepts in this area. How, how can we make it more global? Why can't we have say NASA, NOAA, aircraft, all of these agencies have aircraft. Why can't we arm them with these sensors? But then we have to develop kind of, you know, that's why I say strategy is important, kind of a set of um, sensors we will fly. So you have to kind of have a strategy and then gradually implement and then start collecting data and make the data available. And most importantly, in AI ML ready format. So we can begin to start using it for that and for assimilation. And as you can see, for deep space, the problem remains the same. Lack of data, basically, and multidimensional data in this particular case. And this is really, that's the last slide. 
and you can actually read it kind of some of the things we have to do we are not going not all of us are going to go to the moon right just handful of astronauts will go there but the suborbital commercial space transportation is becoming real and think of all of the issues we must address to do this so i'm i'm going to pause for a bit and see if there are any more questions yeah we are getting close to the 11:30 hour which is uh, probably a good point for us to take a break and get started and i was just going to make one comment uh, to some of you regarding a question that i see uh, people are asking about whether future missions are actually planned i can give you an example of one mission which actually has space weather uh, in mind which is imap which is supposed to have instruments uh, that would be planning for uh, producing such data it was mentioned in one of the lectures in the summer school itself so uh, nasa is thinking about all of this and the other thing i'd like to add to that is during the career discussion i picked up how how uh, uh, energetic many of you are in terms of your voice heard uh, in multiple ways not only in the ways of diversity uh, equity and inclusion but also in terms of your ideas and one of the fortunate developments i think that i at least notice in the funding agencies is there is enormous receptivity to early career voices uh, you know people like me and others and i point only to myself because i'm in that age group which is easy are less interesting to the funding agencies than you are and both in terms of what is going on uh, in curiosity driven science and the larger issue of having a diverse range of voices this is your time to make your presence felt so don't wait necessarily for people to tell you what is interesting because often times you will find in this program definitions and what is being announced there is enough leeway that you can actually uh, send in a proposal within the bounds of responsiveness and be considered very highly because it is your idea and these agencies are asking where is the next generation and who should we be empowering and you fall in that category furthermore when there are announcements regarding serving on these committees and stuff like that that say for example the science mission directorate with nasa of an ask for volunteer uh, a couple of jackety fellows have and they were selected because they volunteered and they said what they bring to the table and they're having a terrific time contributing their voices and ideas to this so some of the questions that you're asking regarding what is possible or not make it possible by telling people what you want you might think this is not going anywhere but it is uh as modulika said i mean things are glacial sometimes but don't give up because you're affecting the change but it's not that glacial you know it's it's historically looking that's what it feels not when you are in it so you know this is kind of i am a believer in stem um i have enabled stuff with all of you it's it's never alone right you need a community behind <laughs> you you can't do something if you actually don't have the community so you know what i think the stem field is absolutely unique this is where you can make the impossible possible and i just don't say this glibly in my life i feel i have achieved that you know things i couldn't imagine parker solar probe being one it was actually an imagination and a dream when i was in boulder colorado as a graduate student little did i know i'd become the program scientist for that mission so each one of you have that ability actually and in the way you have ask thought provoking questions and that's why i was asking you know we should be capturing these questions 
we should be using these questions to generate our research questions. Because these are the future questions. And we'd like to talk to you more about that and hear from you. What are some of your questions? And, and, and don't be inhibited by, oh, it's impossible, can't be done, and I will appear foolish. There is no such thing. Well, in the chat, there is a whole range of uh, really good ideas regarding what is possible uh, to learn from the uh, MAVEN mission to how much carbon there is in Mars, including an idea that I wouldn't want to announce who it came from, a plan to have a nuclear bomb uh, get off on Mars so that it can have a greenhouse effect. Uh, people are having a wonderful set of ideas here and we'll have time for that. But if you guys have questions, ask them. Uh, don't put all your good ideas in the chat. There is time. Or collect them. We want, we actually want to curate them. I do have another question, but it's a little more uh, general, I think. Um, Please, go ahead. Sure. Um, I'm curious about, uh, I, I guess I'm just curious about your thoughts on the interplay between being a good communicator versus uh, perhaps, for lack of better terms, an, an innovator. Uh, when you move into an industry um, so large as uh, you know NASA itself, you know when I talk to uh, young people, I I say certain language skills are vital. And, and when I say interdisciplinary, I just don't mean in the STEM field alone. It's also art and language. That's what kind of keeps the neurons going in our brain. So communication is vital. Because think of it this way. I mean, you, you have to inspire someone. You have to kind of bring someone to your way of thinking. How do you do that? With words, right? So we have to actually develop the communication skill. Along with that, the skills of the computational languages, because that's kind of taking over. You cannot not know that. But communication is critical. Sure, thank you. Since uh, we wouldn't want to uh, take any time away for the interesting wrap up session. So may I suggest with thanks to Madhulika for a stimulating talk and to Kent before, uh, a really good forerunner, uh, that we take a break at this point and reconvene shortly for the wrap up session. Nick, this is your time. Uh, in your good hands, uh, would you like to tell the group what we plan to do from here onwards? Well, as, as uh, Amitava said, let's take a, let's do a five minute break right now. Um, and then uh, when we come back, um, first, uh, be sure if you haven't done so already, almost everybody has done so, but please um, add your group um, number to your, as a suffix to your, or prefix to your name so that Brett can organize um, uh, you all into breakout rooms uh, and we'll go in, I'll, I'll give some instruction about, I want you to discuss some of the ideas that you talked about in your time zone sessions with your synchronous groups and then we'll discuss them as a whole. So, um, so let's do a five minute break. Uh, let's be back by 1140 um, and then we'll have, uh, we'll go into the last activity that we're gonna do for the summer school. Well, one other quick comment is that um, you have a list of emails for all of us. I have received a couple already from students. I promise I'll respond in depth. Uh, some of these comments ask for publications and things like that, and I shall do so um, within a short while after the school. But all the lecturers will be happy to hear from you if there are things that you would like to write to us even after the end of the school. So let's keep open this communication channels. Now go on your break, please, and return shortly and we'll pick up there. Thank you very much.
Okay, uh, turn your videos back on if you're uh, if you're back, please. Okay, almost everybody's back. Uh, if you haven't done so, I think there's still one or two of you who, nope, looks like everybody's got their time zone groups set up. Is that, is that correct, Brett? Uh, yes, I have everybody in their synchronous groups. Uh, yes, that... right, yes, okay. thank you, thank you. Just making sure. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. I misspoke. Um, okay, great. What I'd like you to do is uh presumably you're most of the people I, I is there anybody in a in a synchronous group right now who who has the has somebody from their time zone group in with them did i how much how much of a mistake did i make oh it looks like i i got it right oh good okay so then everybody in your your synchronous group hasn't heard any of the ideas from your time zone group so what i'd like you to do is um we're gonna, I'm gonna send you to your time, your synchronous groups for about 20 minutes or so. And I want you to share at least one idea from each of you that your time zone groups talked about, and maybe two. And then also in that 20 minutes, come to some consensus about like the top two ideas among that, among those, uh, those two. And you're gonna, um present at least one of them on um uh so this is this is like a a sort of quick research review panel right you're doing an evaluation of all the ideas and then you're gonna present them to the group um uh in uh uh in the in the as a whole all right is that a, is that a clear uh uh instruction uh, remember that I'd like you to reference, uh, you know, something that we've discussed during the, the summer school, some some uh, lecture or or discussion. So, what prompted this idea? Um, also, and also, like if you think about the pie in the sky ideas, you may want to um, uh, prioritize those. You don't have to prioritize those; they're they don't have to be pie in the sky, but you know, consider those and. Be sure to be able to um, discuss the relevance of the idea, why it's important, why is it important to do this, right? So, uh, so a few things to think about in your discussion and uh, make sure you know who's gonna present which idea, all right? Questions on that? Great. And so, um, yeah, so we, we can send them off to their groups, Brett. All right, I'm opening the breakout rooms now. Great.
Brett, I think you need to make me co-host so that I can actually circulate. Okay, I apologize. Um, no problem. You are now a co-host. Thank you. You're welcome. No, it still gives me the option of only the organizer room. Oh, really? I've been assigned to breakout room. Okay. Uh, is there a room that you want to go to? I can move you there and then you'll probably get that option. No, I actually don't know. I would have just moved from room to room. It doesn't Let matter you. if I'm creating more problems than solutions. Oh, it's no problem. I'll just move you to breakout room one and then you can move from there. Would that be okay? Okay, that'll be fine. All right, sounds good. Thank you. So, Brett, same thing yes. for me. I think this time you didn't give us that. Um, well, I've moved every all the hosts to the organizer room, um, but I can move you to another room, and then you'll and be then, able to work. So that we can just move around? Yes, correct. Thank you. You're I'm still here, Brett. Okay, you should be getting a notice that says uh, you're being moved to a different room. Is that correct? Oh, he's moved. He's gone. <laughs> And then, uh, Stefan, uh, hey. let me move you yes, right Yes, please. You're welcome. Thanks. And you're trying to move me also, right? Sure. And yeah. so you should get a pop-up that says you'll be moved to breakout room uh, six. Did it pop up for you? Nope. Oh. Well, let me try moving you to another room. How about now? Uh, no. You may have to have your Zoom interface brought up. I'm not quite sure why you're not being moved. Uh, well, um, press escape. Yeah, I'm not sure. Amitabha is back. <laughs> I just saw. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm knowingly I'm not doing anything different. Sure, sure. Um, I went in there and actually uh, having an interesting discussion on taking human beings even closer to the corona. Oh, so on, ah. so I think it's best to leave them to their devices rather than me hang around trying to. <laughs> they were afraid away. to see you. You can hide. It's hard to hide once you show up. I don't want I to create the style. I see. Okay, so we oh. can chat here, Amitava. Yeah, yeah, sure. <sighs> but I, I am, it was really, I, you know, I mean, I don't know what you guys were thinking of at the start of the summer school. But I am uh, just delighted. It, it just really went well. You know, the instructors are only part of the story and a smaller part than the students themselves. I think we have a good crop and a very diverse yes. crop at that. Yes, yes. That, that's what I was kind of saying. And because you all work more closely, you know, do you see that that being a significant component also, or generally the student crop has been going up the quality, right? Yeah. And this year is no exception. Uh, we have had consistently good quality applicants. Yeah, that, that's really, just quite amazing. Uh, to draw the line is always the hard part here. Yeah. It, it's it's quite interesting, you know, this is just very hard for me to communicate, for example. At headquarters, no one understands this because they think all summer schools are the same. Not anybody can do it. No, no, this is really true. Uh, I don't know how to get that across. It's, uh, uh, yeah. The student experience themselves may be worthwhile, but Nick may be able to provide because you know he has participated in multiple summer schools, so he can probably make some statements. Of course, he has to be careful that in yeah. so doing, he doesn't come across as favoring one. But his general observation was that our schools are more diverse and the quality of applicants tend to be higher. And maybe they're 
those have something to do with each other the two and and so if that's the case why do you think that is um I think, you know, the richness of the themes that we have chosen, not just for one summer school, but the range it has covered, reflected in the heliosphere, heliophysics volumes, and certainly in Carol Schreiber's more recent book, is one measure of the intellectual diversity of the school. Uh, and I think that has helped because I think there's been a good balance of science and technology and deliberate efforts at balancing the lecture series for every theme in a way that have brought in both elements. So this would not have been possible without the framework that has been a steady framework in which we have had resources available and the willingness of people to come in, even guest lecturers, to give interesting talks. Anyway, that's what I think. Okay, no, I mean, those are, those are um, yeah, yeah. All, I, th I think, very important points. And I firmly believe the more diverse, the better you are. And I think that having the international component has really helped a lot this particular summer school. It's hard for me to think of this summer school without our international students. I, I, I can't. You, you, you know, pretty much this summer school has trained the heliophysicists of the world. Kid you not.
Hey, Brett. Hey, Nick. Did you uh, send out any kind of a warning? Um, I have not sent out a warning. Okay, uh, why don't you give them, um, uh, let me here, let me put it in chat. Okay. Okay, so, yeah, there we go. Okay. All right, I've sent it out. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe at like eight past the hour, I should, or I guess six past the hour, I should end the breakout rooms. And he's gone. You sent the two minute warning, right? Yep. So six yeah, or seven ten, past ten the hour. Six. Yeah, okay. ten of six is what I see. Cool. Thanks, Kendra. Uh huh. Okay, I'm closing the rooms. Okay, we're all back. All right, I, I heard lots of interesting stuff from uh, when, as I was roaming around. Um, so why don't we hear from uh, a few of the, well, why don't we hear from all the groups, uh, in fact. So let's start with uh, group three. Uh, what's your, you guys get to go first. So you get to pick whatever idea you liked, you liked the best. Yeah. Um. Okay, S3, right? Not T3. S3, yes, please. Okay. So I'll start with our main idea, which is we've been talking a lot about our solar system this week. And our question is what happens when you have a binary star system or a tertiary star system or a star system with four stars? What happens with the solar wind, the magnetic field configuration in the heliosphere? And is there anything like special you would expect in terms of space weather or an exoplanet? 
So that's the overarching question. And we already talked okay. about, about it. Because there's probably a lot of crazy stuff that can happen in that case. Totally. I, and the astronomers wouldn't be looking for those. So it's the heliophysicists who would have to model it. You know, so you measure signatures and how do you interpret them? So you have to create matrix, right? Cool. Okay, cool. All right. Very interesting. Uh, could, I, could I just ask for one bit of elaboration? Did you think about, you know, which pairs of star types would be most interesting? So probably magnetically pulsars. <laughs> All right. but, uh, obviously in the context of like something with having an exoplanet that may, may be similar to Earth, probably just two two suns. Yeah, excellent. Okay. All right, great. Group eight. Hey, Joe, are you presenting? Yeah. Today? Yeah, I sure am. Sorry, I had to change my background to make it relevant. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we were discussing, um, and this is sort of a pie in the sky, but not really, I guess, um, maybe for like a hundred years from now, uh, it'll be good, um, is to send a, like a solar dynamics observatory to a red dwarf star, um, because they're particularly interesting because they're small, um, you know, they're the exoplanets that we've discovered are relatively close in terms of radial distance. Um, but they're also incredibly active stars in terms of producing um, solar flares and high amounts of radiation. Um, so being able to better predict what um, those types of space environments are like and what that means for planetary habitability, um, you know, for those that particular exoplanets, especially ones that are like tidally locked, um, you know, really close to the star, um, that would be super, super interesting. So that, that, was, our, that was our idea. Okay, cool. Comments on that? Thoughts? Questions? Cool, cool and hot. Cool and hot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Gwyn points out that there's a group aiming for interstellar travel in a hundred years. So yes. One. Okay, excellent. Well, you know, there is this breakthrough listen project, right? That is run uh, via Yuri Milner, uh, multi billionaire who has this, you know, starship, not, not with imagers, of course, but for interstellar medium voyage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be really interesting. And um, yeah, no, I'm still holding out for like an Alcubierre warp drive or something like that, you know, living, living the Star Trek dream. Um, yeah. I think it's Starshot. Oh okay, yeah, Starshot, um, I love Starshot too. Group five. Give us one of your ideas. Okay, uh, I'm gonna read it. So the question is, is there any wind associated with the early universe? I also changed the background following Joe. <laughs> and I look to why there is a solar wind. Uh, there must be a cosmic wind background produced after the recombination and permitting the whole universe. Uh, we should fly then a spacecraft really far from our Milky Way and any other galaxy into a void intergalactic, intergalactic place. Uh, this experiment uh, may demonstrate that the CMB is generated by a stellar light scatter uh, on intergalactic charge particles uh, in addition to the, in addition or just uh, uh, changing the uh, current paradigm that is uh, is produced by the early recombination cosmic photosphere. Those uh, uh, bumps in the cosmic radiation background can be then uh, reproduced by just scattering the light, but it's gonna be hard to put a spacecraft uh, away from every, every galaxy. <laughs> okay. It's super cool. <laughs> This one you should think about some more. Maybe there are pieces. Right. Yeah, interact observations of some kind, because going there and taking C2 measurements is going to be super hard. 
and it's super long term too because you're hundreds of light years or thousands of light years away yeah <laughs> all right great uh one group one uh we had no time to choose one but i guess we had the correlation between some ideas and one of them was the dyson sphere and how would the cmes and seps would affect it so in dyson sphere you have uh, the whole planter the whole solar system covered with the uh, energy collecting structures and harnessing the power of the sun completely and how would those fluctuations in the sun would affect those structures whether it's strong enough to break it maybe or no that was our question Let's see, and I didn't do a good job of keeping track who I who I called on, even though I've all, I've only called on four groups. So they are uh, just two. such full of clever ideas. Let's do uh, group two. I think our initial idea of two suns was already kind of taken, so we'll go into the next one. Um, We'll say the one where you know we have the the PFSS model, which kind of goes into predicting the shape of the uh, heliosphere current sheet. And right now, it's a model with decent data input. So if we, rather than having cubesats around the Earth, what if we had a bunch of cubesats around the Sun uh, to take in all of this data and better predict? Um, not only what this heliospheric current sheet looks like, but in essence, um, being able to better predict uh, CMEs and CIRs. Hey, I say no fair. That's one of my ideas too, but you guys have to implement. <laughs> How long would a CubeSat last around the sun that close? It doesn't have to be close. Um, you know, it can be in one AU orbit like stereo, but the problem is really one with communication, right? How do you do telemetry and get data? So you'll have to have uh, inter orbit kind of communication. So there are some, some, so that's what I was saying, you know, there's propulsion, there is communication, there are some uh, hard uh, technological uh, problems we also have to address. And I Actually, these are things that STMD is thinking of and working on. Is it uh, the, the Sunrise mission uh, upcoming? Uh, I think that uses um, overshot GPS signals for communication purposes. Right, right. All right, great. Uh, group five. Group five? Group, uh, sorry, group four. Okay, so uh, first of all, please bear with me because my, my internet connection is really unstable. So uh, the the thing that we wanted to share from our group is about uh, CME dynamics. So what we the the problem that we pose here is strongly correlated to the talk by Zhang Xu. So she was talking about the injected polaridal and toroidal flux in ejecting the flux rope. So what we wanted to make sure is. We wanted to we want to uh, understand the relative importance of the injected polaridal flux and the toroidal flux in the expansion of the CME during different phases of a solar cycle. And why do we want to do that? Because if we get an understanding of which is the driving force behind the expansion of the CME during different phases of solar cycle, we will get an idea about the expansion of the CME. Once we get an idea of the expansion of the CME at higher heights, just from the injected polaridal flux, let's say then we will get to know what is the drag interaction between the solar wind and the CME at higher height because I can expect the Lorentz force will be very, very small. So then that will give us an idea about the expected arrival time of the CMEs at that particular hour. And this is really important because we have so many space missions plans coming up and we tend to uh, speak that is it important to launch a space mission during solar minima. But again, we have to keep in mind that during solar minima, we have this polaridal flux, and it is this dominating polaridal flux that gives rise to the ex expansion of the flux rope. 
So if you get to correlate the polar flux injected to the expansion of the flux rate, that will be really important to see whether we get to catch. Oops, he wasn't kidding about his internet connection. Hello. Yes. I think we just, <laughs> Did you guys I think we heard most we heard most of it. So what was the what was the final the final thought on on uh, on doing this? Okay. Oh I think my screen froze again. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so the final thought is to come up with some kind of empirical relationship that will help me to relate the injected polydial flux to the arrival time of the CMS at Earth. Cool. All right. And that's very important. That would so, be really important. I think it, it's, uh, well, yeah. yeah. Because uh, also there was a series of paper recently by NASA GSFC by the group of Gopal Swami and they have showed that how important is the outer heliospheric pressure on the expansion of the hello that are coming towards Earth. So that's what. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. True. Great. Group um, group six. I don't think you guys have presented one yet. Is that right? Um, no, not yet. Um, we had a, one that was already said, which was the binary um, star. I think it would be really interesting to see the like what the solar wind would be like or the stellar winds and how they'd interact. Um, and then the other one we had was to create like a cluster or like a just a really large um, number of spacecraft like with plasma suites and stuff um, throughout the heliosphere. Um, this would be super helpful for like a lot of reasons. But the one that comes to my mind immediately is for data model comparisons. Because like with the model, you have information everywhere, right? And with data, you're really, really limited to, you know, the fact that your instruments are nailed to a spacecraft, which is only in one place at one time. So having a lot of spacecraft um, in different areas of the heliosphere is, is would be really, really cool. Um, you know, things like cluster and an MMS, but on like a bigger, bigger scale. Okay, so are you, let me just ask, are you thinking of uh, four pi steradians or all the different radii or both or? I mean, I personally, I want to have like Maven all over the place, everywhere, at every planet, like millions of them, you know? Um, Absolutely, but, yeah. Yeah, so it would be really cool. I think, yeah, getting like the four pi is really important, especially if you can get out of the ecliptic at all. Um, and definitely like the different radii. So yeah, ideally just like fill the whole parameter space. But that's really expensive, so it will never happen, but it would be nice. <laughs> Don't think like that. <laughs> the ways to make it less expensive. <laughs> True. And, and you know, so in the geospace context, we are thinking, we, we started thinking, hundred of you know spacecraft looking at uh, just in that constellation uh, form for the ionospheric conditions because that's where you're doing spatial temporal distribution um, that are pretty rapid cadence right and so NASA is going forward with a concept I don't know ultimately how many spacecraft it will be but there'll be another uh, you know mission with a constellation kind of approach Great. Uh, group seven, I don't think you've given, me an, given us an idea yet. Is that right? Yeah, so um, it's funny. Our group was also interested in the idea of modeling the binary system. So that's really popular. <laughs> um, but we thought it'd be interesting to understand the pre-flare processes um, with near-sun observations of magnetic reconnection and eruption processes using data from Parker Solar Probe and Solar Orbiter missions, and how these observations can just be used for improving space weather models overall. What's the, did you have some idea of why they would be, why that would be useful or what the aspects of that would be useful? Um, 
I don't study the sun. This was Pooch's question. Okay. <laughs> if anyone wants to weigh in. Somebody from group seven, help Angela out. Well, yeah, I don't know either about the pre-flare uh, like signatures, but already the suffix pre tells you that if you can get some information about the upcoming flare before, that would be nice. Right. <laughs> so okay. That's basically what we were thinking. Great. Thank you. More right. than just okay. nice. <laughs> More than, said, more, more than just nice. nice. I think that that would be really interesting. From here, you got you're too either too close or too far from your mic. <laughs> it's really broken up. I mean, it's, and and everybody's holding their ears. Yeah. Fine. So type it in chat. That was the reason why we didn't come up with the one idea. <laughs> Type it and shout. Sorry, Premier. That's a good response. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Other other ideas about uh, uh, that that came up in in your in your discussion. Other pie in the sky ideas. I think we've heard a few, but uh, is it? Does that phrase, did, how many people had to explain pie in the sky to other members of your group? Okay. I mean, which pie in the sky do you mean? I mean, there is the phrase pie in the sky and then there is pie steradians in the sky. Oh. <laughs> I Come think on. that's a colloquialism. <laughs> other other ideas that you want to share? Uh, I yeah, I just, uh, yeah, I have something. Just I want to share my screen so that you can see the questions. Sure. Yep. Yeah. So um, regarding, oops, sorry. Regarding the pie in the sky ideas. So there are a few, we just uh, write down. Okay, except the last few ones. Those are really <laughs> hectic things anyway. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, the first question says that if we can have a spacecraft so that we can fly into the giant red spot, of Jupiter, and also uh -huh. the red blue spot of Neptune, so so that we can have some idea about the storms uh, on the uh, planets, actually. Uh, the other is that if we have a spacecraft so that we can probe into the ocean of Europa under the uh, icy crust of Europa, then it would be nice. And the third one is the Galilean moons that uh, why are the moons are not the same actually. Like Io has a volcanic thing and uh, Ganymede has its own magnetosphere kind of things. So what's mm -hmm. the history of the moons? And the last two are so not necessary. Anyway. And, yeah, well, right. <laughs> We're all wondering that. Uh, okay, great. I will pass this on to our planetary science division. Yeah, sure. Thank the you. The trouble is, if we undertake any of this, you know, all the money from heliophysics division will gravitate towards the planet. <laughs> so I'll think about it. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Also, I think you should eliminate question four from the list. It's very interesting, <laughs> but uh, I don't think I you know. should pick it up. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Do you want to read out question four? No, no, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. You can, you yeah. can stop sharing now. <laughs> yeah. You always want to be aware of what you're sharing when you're sharing it. It's, it's the color of sunlight that kind of can make our hair look orange. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We are like thinking like that. So again, supposing. <laughs> uh, any final any final things anybody wanted? Any final ideas anybody wanted to share? All right. 
Um, I think we're done. So I, I have to say that um, I'm certainly pleased. I will, of course, hear from, we will hear from you during the evaluations, but I'm certainly pleased about the work that was going on over the last two weeks and, and um, really appreciate all of your um, interactions, your, your willingness to participate in this experiment uh, and your, um, uh, I appreciate the, the talent and the work and the capabilities that, uh, and the thoughtfulness that you have all had uh, in participating in the work you're doing in uh, the questions you've asked. And um, it's uh, really been a pleasure to get to know you. And I hope at some point we get to, we can get together in, in person and, uh, and share a beer and talk about science and talk about uh, other things and, and, uh, and get to know each other better. Um, I uh, will invite Amitabha and Dana and Lika. Uh, oh, first off, before we do that, um, I wanna thank Kendra and Tammy for uh, their work on uh, organizing us and getting us all together. And Brett for and making- Brett And uh, Brett and the other uh, multimedia yes. people too, yes. thank you. You're welcome. But uh, I also think this, Nick is the one who's been really keeping this running and keeping it going and in a pretty new format for us. So Nick, thank you. I'd like to ditto those comments made, thank Nick, Tammy, Kendra, all the lecturers for great talks, but most of all, to thank you. Um, you are what this school is about. And I'm very impressed with the breadth of your interests, um, not only in science, but also in terms of how many of you are very responsive to what is sweeping the world right now. Um, and I hope, because I strongly believe that a diverse community is a better community. The more perspectives we have, the richer we are, that um, you have very strong support from all of us as you make your cases within your own institution and to the world outside. And in so doing, you will push, be pushing forward not only the frontiers of heliophysics, but also where we all should be going uh, together in this social milieu. Thank you all very, very much. It's been a real learning experience for me. Hope you've learned a few things and please let us know what you have enjoyed and what you have not so that we can be better. Thank you all very much. So just one last thing that I do wanna say. Um, it has been a pleasure working with all of you. And I think with Nick and Dana and Amitava and Lika, it has been a wonderful experience for all of you too. So um, I wish you all the best. Thanks. And so I, I would kind of say Roger to everything that has been said before. Um, it was quite extraordinary, you know, in the short period of time that we came together, adjusted and created the program. And of course, there are many that have played vital critical roles, many other supportive roles, but it's the ingenuity in us, right? That allows us to do what we do. And you know, all of you have kind of shared a little window of your ingenuity, your willingness to ask questions, to learn, to play along with us. Um, that, that, those are the joys of also doing science. And uh, I hope that we have stimulated all of you, uh, you know, for the coming decades.
to actually go after some of those ideas that you think are crazy today, but actually make them reality for future. So I want to thank actually all of us. We have all played an important role in making this happen. Thanks so much. <laughs> Nick, we need the champagne bottle sound. <laughs> <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> I, you know, this is, I don't know how to, how to end this because usually we just sort of say, where people are able to say goodbye and and uh, uh, and uh, uh, and that sort of thing and and you know go off on on do some things in Boulder. Uh, at this point in time, I think uh, we're at the point where we're we're almost ready to just push the button and everybody goes away. Um, and so please keep in touch with each other. Keep in touch with us. Keep in touch with each other. You've met. Uh, a number of, you've had an opportunity to uh, introduce a number of people. People are holding up their glasses. So I've got tea. Yes. Okay. And or it's not goodbye. We will meet somewhere, someday. Wonderful. So, till we meet again. Right. Uh, um, it's been a pleasure. And go, go off and do great things. Thank you. Bye, everyone. All right. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you, Thank you so Thank much. You Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Enjoy your summer, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a very new kind of experience. Oh, yeah, I know. It's, it's an <laughs> electronic experience that you can turn people on and off. <laughs> yeah. My, my human really, mammalian that really off. has an adjustment. It's slightly different. New. <laughs> it's only slightly different than the situation where we had like a shuttle waiting outside of Center Green for everyone right. to, right. to get on the shuttle. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, it actually, that was the thing that was bothering